My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Uh, today I'm really, really pleased uh, to be inviting Dr. Mansour Nazir, who's a consultant electrophysiologist, uh, to, to the channel. Uh, Dr. Nazir was actually my teacher. He was a very good teacher. He taught me a lot of electrophysiology. I wasn't a very good student, so I still have to come back to him and ask him his advice. A lot of patients uh, who watch this channel are interested in heart palpitations. They suffer from heart palpitations. And often I get questions, uh, I get questions through email or during consultations, and I don't feel equipped to answer them because I'm not an electrical specialist, I'm a general cardiologist. So when Dr. Nazir kindly offered uh, to do this, I leapt at the chance because uh, he is a wealth of information. So today we thought we'd talk about atrial fibrillation and in particular atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, so Dr. Nazir, thank you so much for joining us and I think you'll be joining us on several future uh, um, discussions as well. Uh, but tell us about atrial fibrillation. Your insight of atrial fibrillation uh, will be far more advanced than mine. So tell us a little bit about atrial fibrillation and then, of course, tell us what the consequences of atrial fibrillation can be. Okay. Thank you very much, Sanjay. You are a very good student. So don't <laughs> underestimate yourself. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a very common rhythm, which we are seeing more and more frequently, not because only uh, our population is aging, the burden of different uh, disease process is there and this is a disease process uh, atrial fibrillation is a rhythm problem of elderly but we are also noticing with because of more easy to diagnose like we have uh, these uh, fitbit watches and other things which are telling patients what is their rhythm that we are finding more and more younger patients who have atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation is a rhythm problem of the upper chamber of the heart which uh, drives the lower chamber with it. So lower chamber, which is our main pumping chamber, is just an innocent bystander suffering from the problem of the upper chamber. Let me give you a little understanding of the heart. The heart has two upper chambers where the blood comes and uh, comes from the body on the right side, from the lungs on the left side. The pumping chambers are the lower chambers. Our pacemaker, all of us have a pacemaker sitting in the right upper chamber. It discharges an electrical impulse which then stimulates the upper chambers first and after a little delay the same impulse stimulates the lower chamber so there is a synchrony between upper and lower chamber so the first upper chambers contract and then the lower chambers it's the contraction of the lower chambers which gives you the pulse heart doesn't know where it is being stimulated from so any electrical activity can create a contraction in atrial fibrillation the upper chamber starts beating at almost 600 beats per minute. We don't know, even know what number it is. So it's very, very, very fast. And the connection between the upper and the lower chamber does not allow all of these impulses to go through. A few of them are stopped. Quite a lot of them, they pass through. And it ends up with a heart rhythm which becomes fast and irregular. So that is what is the hallmark of this rhythm problem, fast and irregular heart rhythm. It has its origin in different places depending upon whether you have a primary rhythm problem called primary atrial fibrillation or it is because of damage to the heart from some other reason, for example, heart attack, heart failure, valve problems. They damage the heart and then you develop atrial fibrillation as a consequence of that damage. So we have to separate these two because uh, most of the time uh, we deal with, or I would like to deal with proximal atrial fibrillation because I can cure that. Whereas permanent or persistent atrial fibrillation where some damage has been done to the heart is very difficult to cure even with the current technology. So one question I had, which is really, um, I think a lot of people uh, are worried about is, lots of people get ectopics, extra beats, missed beats, thuds, skips, flutters. At what point do skips, flutters, thuds get classified as atrial fibrillation? Because I always thought that, you know, you'd have to have something going on continuously for at least 30 seconds before you call it something else. Anything less than 30 seconds is just a bunch of ectopics. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, when you have a single ectopic beat, and that's the most common rhythm problem with our patients present because they think that their heart has stopped. Yeah. There is a pause, and uh, that is what they are worried about. Is it is my heart going to continue working, or it has just stopped and it's permanently? That's that's uh, usually a single heartbeat. The tissues which are responsible for the generating these extra heartbeats, they re reside in the upper chamber quite frequently in the veins which are bringing blood from the lungs into the heart. The pulmonary, pulmonary veins. veins. Pulmonary veins yeah. And these tissues have been sucked into those pulmonary veins during our development. And they may or may not be connected to the heart through muscle fibers. Okay. So whenever there is these tissues fire, the heart would not know whether it is a normal heart which is firing or something else. So initially you people start with single extra beat which may happen maybe once twice a, a day and then they become more frequent and then the frequency increases the interval between them decreases and you start getting more and more frequent attacks 30 second is considered to be what we call sustained rhythm problem because that's the time when most people would feel something is mm -hmm. not right but for atrial fibrillation you have uh, our definition is a little bit different. We use it uh, proxismal, permanent, and persistent atrial fibrillations. Proxismal is an atrial fibrillation which stops on its own, usually a few seconds, two minutes, mm -hmm. but less than a few days. Okay. So up to seven days we call, if it stops on its own, we still call it proxismal atrial fibrillation. If the atrial fibrillation is longer, and but you shock the rhythm back to normal, and it stays normal, we call it pers persistent because it requires some treatment to mm. be uh, brought back to normal. And the third is permanent where even the shock doesn't work. So these are different grades of severity as well. Proxismal is stopping on its own, heart is usually completely normal. Whereas in permanent, heart is damaged, so we cannot do much about that. So we have to f we find patients in this spectrum from a few ectopic beats to persistent atrial fibr uh, permanent atrial fibrillation every day in our clinical practice. So it's interesting. Um, I use the analogy. It's almost like people on a boat rowing. Uh, some are lazy, so uh, they stop for a little while and then they start up again. Mm -hmm. Some need a kick, like a cardioversion or something like that. That's mm -hmm. persistent. Yeah. And some are dead they're essentially, dead. and they're therefore they're not contributing at all. Yes. And therefore, I guess being paroxysmal tells you that the atria are still capable of working and therefore those are the patients who benefit most from interventions to try and get them out of the atrial fibrillation long term. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, as I mentioned, they start, uh, uh, let me uh, give you a little uh, definition here. There is a primary problem where you have uh, something wrong with the electricity. There is a focus which generates these mm -hmm. things. And then there is a secondary problem. The secondary problems are usually because of scarring. Here you have a trigger which just fires and when it tires, rhythm goes back to normal. On the other side, there may still be a trigger, but it goes through scarred upper chamber and then it just persists. Right. So there, these are the two different things. We have to prevent the proxismal going towards persistent or permanent. Usually, unless the heart is damaged, they just carry on doing that for years and years, decades almost. So a lot of people worry about that because they say, my concern is that I'm getting paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. I feel so awful because a lot of people do. Uh, and my biggest concern is it'll become persistent. In my own experience, uh, I've found that when it becomes persistent, it's not as troublesome for the patient as when they're paroxysmal because it is the unexpected suddenness. You know, one yeah. minute you're used to it, uh, you're used to a normal rhythm, then you go out, then you go back in. It can happen at the most inconvenient times. You're waiting. Whereas with persistent uh, or permanent atrial fibrillation, sometimes you can just it becomes your normal rhythm, so to speak. And so the body adapts much quicker. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think uh, uh, most of our patients are elderly mm -hmm. and quite a lot of them don't even know that they are in atrial fibrillation. That's because they are in permanent atrial fibrillation. Their rhythm is one rhythm rather than changing between uh, normal and other. And 
the commonest reason we are implanting pacemakers is when a patient goes from atrial fibrillation stops and the normal pacemaker takes long time to recover right. and that is the pause during which patients have symptoms they black out they fall they have injuries during these falls and yeah i agree with that that when the patient is in and out of rhythm they are more symptomatic than they are permanently in atrial fibrillation in in some ways i'm almost tempted to suggest that the people who are people who have structurally normal hearts are generally more likely to be paroxysmal they're generally likely to be younger fitter healthier people whereas the older sicker population diabetes high blood pressure heart disease etc they're the ones that tend to be persistent and they're the ones who tend to be less symptomatic so it's a little bit like having a new ferrari healthy beautiful ferrari any little thing in that you will notice mm. whereas if you're an old banged up skoda for example then uh, you know all this goes and you don't notice because your body adapts it's really interesting and also another interesting thing i've observed is that actually the ones who feel their atrial fibrillation the most tend to be at a lower risk mm-hmm. okay. compared to the patients who don't feel it yeah. you know so where it affects your quality of life more it seems to not have as bad a prognosis as where you don't know anything about it silent af it's not bothering you but because you're sicker your body has adapted over a number of years and that sick heart exposes you to more risks in the future would you agree with yeah. that i think uh, uh, as i mentioned asymptomatic patients by definition they are not having any symptom they are not not at risk Mm. they are at risk for example they may be at risk of developing heart failure mm. if we don't control their heart rate very well they may be at risk of developing blood clots and causing strokes so one of the major causes of strokes when we have no obstruction to the uh, arteries supplying blood to the brain is atrial fibrillation so even when patients are totally asymptomatic they are not risk free we Absolutely. have to do some Uh, assessments and this is why it is so important for patients to understand that your quality of life does not necessarily equate to no risk length of life and quality of life have to always be considered independently absolutely and therefore people will come to me with atrial fibrillation and say i feel fine why do i need to take anticoagulants when i feel fine and i say well you know when you go into a car you don't decide on how you're feeling that day whether you wear a seat belt or not the seat belt is your covering your risk whereas the music you play in your car or how you're feeling that day dictates your quality of life so it's very important to for people to understand that that even though you may be asymptomatic there may still be risk but also just because you are very symptomatic doesn't necessarily mean yeah, your risk I'm, has gone up excessively yeah, yeah. atrial fibrillation has three problems for me one what is it causing the patient mm-hmm. is the patient symptomatic from it or not symptoms like palpitations consequence of palpitation like breathlessness chest pains dizzy spells unexplained falls mm-hmm. generalized weakness or episodic weakness these are the symptoms which i associate to with atrial fibrillation second is is this patient at risk of developing heart failure the heart can go weak if we leave it at a fast rate for more than to 3 months like 130 beats per minute for 3 months practically guaranteed to give you heart failure really? that is one of the process where heart failure is generated in experimental animals yeah the third is development of stroke so all of these have to be assessed when a patient whether symptomatic or asymptomatic presents to our clinics so um uh, a couple of things i wanted to ask you and then we can talk about af fibrillation one you said that you can't tell that this uh, embryonic heart that has been sucked into the pulmonary veins mm-hmm. uh, surrounding the pulmonary veins is connected or disconnected from the atria so are you saying that those people who present with atrial fibrillation are by them by, by the the very nature of presentation declaring themselves as people who have a connected vein and so if you have a disconnected um if you have pulmonary veins which are disconnected for, uh, you know the embryonic tissue is disconnected from the heart does that mean you won't ever develop atrial fibrillation no the atrial fibrillation the current our understanding and the way we treat it is that there's a tissue which has grown into the pulmonary vein and is connected but there are 
rogue tissues inside the atrium okay. as well. They can start generating uh, electrical impulses like uh, Krista terminalis area, which is very commonly known to cause these extra heartbeats. So that becomes very interesting because I guess one of your challenges then is to know uh, where to ablate when you have a patient with atrial fibrillation. How do you determine whether the AF is coming from the pulmonary veins, which I think is what you try and isolate in mm -hmm. uh, ablation, mm -hmm. or coming from somewhere else? And could that therefore then mean that some people may be getting it from somewhere else and they think the ablation has failed, but actually the wrong bit was ablated? Exactly. Uh, our understanding at present is that about 80% of the atrial fibrillation in proxismal atrial fibrillation comes from the veins. So in our first go, we tend to isolate them. Okay. Because traditionally the process of uh, uh, pulmonary vein isolation was so long that we used to just limit ourselves to those four isolations. Nowadays, we have quicker, safer procedures to do. We have uh, freezing technology in which we isolate the veins by just freezing. We can assess at that stage whether there is any other focus. Okay. Like we can stimulate the heart by giving adrenaline. Uh, we cannot give them alcohol in the lab, but uh, that's a stimulant. We, we use uh, stimulants to wake up these tissues. And if they are inside the heart, we can map them. We can find where they are, and then we can touch them very easily. But as I mentioned, traditionally, we just isolate the four veins because we don't know which vein it is coming from, so we isolate all four of them. Once we have isolated, that is our first procedure and maybe the last procedure. If we are lucky, we are in those 80% of the cases. But if we are in those 20% where it is not the pulmonary vein responsible, we can go back and map it out. And uh, that process has become quite, not challenging, not only challenging, but very entertaining as well, because it's just finding the needle in the haystack and you know that you can find <laughs> it, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very, it takes time, it takes experience and technology yeah, yeah. also helps. I mean, I remember, you know, when you used to look for the needle in the haystack and I was your student, I used to fall asleep. Exactly. But that's, exactly. I, I always used to turn around and say, oh, this is very difficult. And, um, but it's clearly, you know, it's, uh, we're, everyone is grateful for people who are like you, who are so focused and can actually put in that hard work of looking for this needle in the haystack for the benefit of the patient. So that's incredible. Yeah. So my question then is, okay, so we know, so uh, could you then tell me uh, what is the benefit of uh, an ablation and who is the most uh, suitable candidate? Because I guess that patient selection is important, you, you know. So how do you decide uh, why do you do an ablation? What is the benefit? You talked about quality of life versus risk versus this tachycardia induced uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, what benefit does the ablation give you and how do you select the most likely patient to, who will benefit? I think uh, with my almost 20 years of experience of doing ablations, the only thing which I think I have learned is select the patient wisely. Mm -hmm. Because if you are selecting patients with the uh, proxismal atrial fibrillation with a focus, mm -hmm. you do very well. The patient does very well. You know, uh, just do one procedure and you are done. You have cured the patient. We cure the patient for symptoms most of the time because these patients do not have anything else. So we, when we are doing this procedure, we cure the patient from symptoms. What if the patient comes late and has developed heart failure? If now I ablate this patient, I get two benefits. Mm -hmm. One, I improve their symptoms. Two, the heart failure goes back to normal. So it's a reversible heart failure. Reversible. Rate. This is oh, a, wonderful. one of the reversible causes of heart failure. Remember, yeah. heart failure is very, very poor prognosis. But this is a reversible cause. And the third is we reduce the risk of this patient developing thromboembolism, the blood clots and the strokes. So proxismal, very good results. Even patients who have heart failure, they benefit if we can keep their rhythm in normal by ablations or medical treatment. Generally, medical treatment doesn't work that well. But with ablation, if we can get a successful result, we get very good results with it. So you, what you're saying is that if you are asymptomatic and your heart is strong, then an ablation doesn't really offer you very much. If you are truly asymptomatic, you have no problems, you get paroxysms, which people pick up on monitors, etc. 
but you, your heart is nice and strong. There's no need for an ablation because what does it achieve? Symptoms. Uh, Symptoms control is uh, uh, our... If someone is totally symptomatic, the other two things, we, obviously we will keep an eye mm. on that, that the patient's risk of thromboembolism is sorted mm. and the risk of developing heart failure is sorted. Mm. But main interest of giving patients ablation is their symptom. But does do you think that... Um, an ablation, a successful ablation, takes away the risk of strokes. What I'm trying to work out is if you take away the AF, do you take away the risk of strokes or does the risk stay? Because some people would say, well, I hate the idea of taking anticoagulants. You know, that scares me. I'm, I lead a very active life. I don't want to take anticoagulants. But my CHADS2 vasc score, my risk of strokes is high. I have diabetes. I have high blood pressure, etc. If they have had an ablation, how confidently can you say, well, I've taken away your risk of strokes? Very difficult. Very good question. The problem is most patients would feel some of their proxisms, not all of them. Yeah, okay. So if I am only going to rely on the symptoms, then I am going to probably miss half of your proxisms. So for me to stop anticoagulation, if someone has Chadwa score of, say, 3, is very difficult question. I I am very reluctant to stop it, especially when they have asymptomatic episodes as well. So what we generally tend to do is we rely on the symptoms, we mm -hmm. control their symptoms, that's our one important facet of treatment. We have got rid of the symptoms. But is the patient now symptom uh, risk-free? No, they are not. So sometimes patients who are very active, they want to come off this medication, it interferes with their lifestyle, we then do long-term monitoring. Some centers that implant a loop recorder, mm. and that loop recorder is a device which gives information about your rhythm every night to us after 24-hour summary. And if the rhythm is practically normal for months and months, we can talk about stopping with the knowledge that if the patient has asymptomatic episodes, they are at risk of developing a stroke. There's one question that has always struck me then. Are we saying that it is the atrial fibrillation, be that symptomatic or asymptomatic, that harbors the formation of the clot in the left atrium? Because my understanding is that some studies have looked at timing of AF versus timing of stroke on implantable loop recorders, etc. And no good correlation no. has been found between when you have the AF and when you have your stroke. So now, you could have the stroke for some other reason. It may not be because of the AF. But increasingly, people are now talking about this concept of a weak atrium harboring the clot rather than the fibrillating atrium, you know, almost like electrical, dis electrical mechanical, mechanical dissociation of yeah. the uh, atria, you yeah. know, where it can still be weak but it may still be in sinus rhythm. Like yeah. in the left ventricle, the left ventricle can be weak, but you don't have to be in ventricular fibrillation. So yeah. in that sense, my understanding, certainly in my practice, I if they need anticoagulation before for the sake of their AF, then I continue the anticoagulation, even if they've had a successful ablation. On the other hand, if we are just anticoagulating them for the ablation, then I would take it off. Would that be right? Yeah, that that's the, no. that is that basically defines two groups of patients. The first group, uh, the second group, which you have mentioned, is the proximal atrial fibrillation. They are very symptomatic. Their mm. life stops as soon as you hit mm. uh, atrial fibrillation episodes. They are very well aware when they are going to be in atrial fibrillation. Most of them, they know how to feel their pulse if they're not their palpitation. So these are the patients who are very well aware, very low incidence of asymptomatic episodes. They can be, if you have started, and usually their Chadwa score is low as well. Mm. So you have just started it for ablation purpose. So after ablation, I wait for three months, repeat ECG, ask the patient, do a, a few days monitor, and if everything is satisfactory, we stop the medication, we stop the oral anticoagulant. The other group with high Chadwa score, I'm usually very reluctant, and I try to persuade the patient just to carry on. Yeah. One important thing is that it used to be terribly difficult to be on warfarin. Remember, yeah. it was re repeated ex uh, tests need to be done. You were not allowed to take some vegetables. You were not yeah, allowed yeah. to take some medications. So it was quite a 
interference in your quality of life with warfarin with this new medication which you are uh, which are coming it's just like aspirin mm. you just take a tablet and that's it yeah. it works and actually i my understanding also is that the risks are no greater with some of the newer ones than just being on aspirin on there there's one study which suggested that the bleeding risk from a doac is much so certainly intracranial bleeding etc is lower than with the warfarin yeah with warfarin not with aspirin mm. uh, aspirin we do not use aspirin. no of course aspirin clopidogrel or other blood thinning tablets which are generally used for uh, coronary artery disease we don't use it there warfarin was our standard but now multiple mm. other medications and their risk are actually less with brain bleeding because i remember i think one of our scottish first minister died because he was yeah. taking uh, warfarin and uh, that uh, one incident puts hundreds of patients away oh, from yeah. warfarin That's but right. these new medications they are very effective as effective as warfarin is and less of a risk of any complications so dr nazir um how can you talk us through the af ablation procedure we know why we're doing it we know that it's the paroxysmal af patients who are more likely to benefit what what is how how do you do the procedure what do you actually do is it under general anesthetic is it under local anesthetic mm. uh, how long does it last yeah it is a very important question because patients are coming we do it every day so we don't care <laughs> but the patient is going to come yeah. maybe only once it's a day case procedure uh, you go home the same night the same day mm -hmm. yeah we do it under local anesthetic okay and uh, if we are uh, using the freezing technology we don't need to give any painkillers as well right so we approach the circulation through the groin we pass catheters in the groin there are a couple of mapping catheters and then there is our ablation catheter ablation catheters could be either a freeze catheter or a burn, burn catheter traditionally we started with burning because uh, that is how we initially started the burning our supraventricular tachycardia a single pinpoint burn and cure bingo uh, atrial fibrillation was a little different it was a beast which uh, required a lot of effort what we do after we pass the catheters in the groin we cross into the left side of the heart the right and left side are separate there is a membrane which separates mm. the upper chamber of the right and left and the uh, uh, lower chambers as well so we cross the that uh, membrane and enter the left system you puncture the septum we puncture the septum with a needle okay so uh, once we have crossed into the left side then we take information from there we create a geometry of that structure where are the veins where are the other structure which are the vital structure which we are not going to touch and things like that once we have made a shell of the atrium then we depending upon which technology we are using if we are burning we go to inside of the heart not inside the vein just at the margin where the vein connects to the heart mm -hmm. and start burning the tissue so we go point by point around the whole circumference of the tissue so it was it used to be a quite long process almost 4 hour long procedure that would give us a good burning of this tissue is that we are destroying the connections between that tissue which is responsible for this atrial fibrillation coming to the heart latest technology is that we pass a balloon and we inflate it and then push it against the wall so this balloon ah. partly is inside the vein partly is outside but its circumference is such that it is touching the whole of the circumference ah. then we decrease its temperature to minus 40 ah. so it is a burn but by freezing so the frost bites and things like so we have now caused a lesion around the circumference by freezing it when we are freezing it actual ice forms on it the blood the water in it, in in blood becomes ice and it forms on it so we just put it there freeze the vein takes about 4 minutes 5 minutes to do and then decrease the temp, uh, increase the temperature back to normal temperature of the so it takes about 5 minutes to do one freeze so we take the catheter out of that vein go into the second vein freeze it so all four veins are touched in this way we can tell from the catheter whether we are successful 
So any connections which we are seeing before, there is a conduction between the heart and the vein or vein to the heart, we can assess. So we can tell at the end whether we have been successful or not, both with freezing as well as with burning. But I presume the the benefit of the freezing is obviously that uh, you have the balloon, so it's much easier to do in that sense. But obviously you would have to freeze for much longer than you burn. So does freezing, uh, uh, is freezing uh, preferred now or is it, does it take less time or does burning take less time? Uh, in one way it's easier because you've got the balloon and you can do it like that obviously but I guess freezing takes much longer than burning right to, to, to and kill. Wrong. No, in terms of the actual damage you're doing to the tissue you have to freeze you know it's like if yes. I burn you the, yes. it's just literal yeah. one second to burn but uh, uh, burning used to be we have tried everything we have tried a point burn we have tried a mesh burn we have mm. tried a, a ring burn and all of these things but when you are doing a point by point which was considered to be the start of standard now just before the balloons came that used to take you remember we have to put a burn which is about two to three millimeters and the whole circumference may require 20 burns so every burn is say 30 seconds to uh, a minute yeah. so now you are spending a lot of time there in freeze you do one burn so as you put it there it freezes the whole circumference. So that way it becomes much quicker as compared to point by point. Okay. And the only drawback is sometimes it is not as permanent. Exactly, that's what I'm there, there might be some connection still there or they may recover because they, if you haven't frozen them properly, they may recover. Mm -hmm. So when they recover, it usually is, we have to do a second procedure in which some, patient, some people actually use the burn then because they can find where this gap is ah there it is and they touch it and it's cured i someone used an analogy i read somewhere it's like building a fence around a bunch of wayward horses mm -hmm. so that's what you're trying to do but yeah. unfortunately even if one breaks one little thing loses the yeah. horses escape and the whole thing goes absolutely that's yeah yeah when we used to do the burning bit before these uh, balloons came uh, single procedure I don't remember uh, very often we were successful. Maybe our experience was not good enough, but uh, finding that gap and burning it was so satisfying <laughs> that you could see, ah, there is the gap and there you are. And patient goes into normal sinus rhythm with, uh, with that. How interesting. What are your, uh, so what do you count as a successful, uh, in terms of, you know, because obviously you can have silent AF, so patient can still go and still be discovered to be an AF. Do you count the success rate as uh, the patient complaining of less symptoms? Is that your measure of success? Is it a measure? Is your success measured by no AF whatsoever, uh, as described by the patient, or is it no AF full stop? And for how long? Mm -hmm. uh, at what point is it five years? If the AF occurs after five years, does that count as a success rate for the AF ablation or, uh, or is it meant to be permanent? It is difficult. I am treating my patient. I'm treating his symptoms. I'm trying to get him better, feel better. So my main interest is getting rid of all his symptoms. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, there are lots of patients who would have asymptomatic episodes as well. We talk about these things beforehand that look, there's a good chance that you may keep on having these which may or may not be symptomatic. My main interest is getting rid of all the symptomatic ones and giving you a better quality of life. Success for me, I need to have at least some improvement. It's not that the patient is not feeling anything, I'm comfortable, no. When I'm doing a procedure, I want to make sure that I have isolated everything. That is my first. Second, I haven't harmed the patient. Of course. Third, we will do some monitoring afterwards to confirm that we have made total loss of uh, atrial fibrillation or at least a significant improvement. For example, I may do a seven day monitor and if the patient has three beats, I wouldn't say that is a failure. Okay. The patient hasn't felt it. Mm. There are a few beats of it. So I wouldn't call, they may be from other sources as well. Mm. So for me, symptom is the most important thing but I try to get a good result at the time of ablation and follow it with 
showing that there has been no symptomatic as well as asymptomatic episodes. It comes more important when you are thinking of stopping anticoagulation. Yeah, of course. Yeah, patient may be totally asymptomatic, but if they are still getting some proxism, I have to sit with them and talk about oral anticoagulation. What is uh, your, uh, I mean, I guess all, all about success is measured from clinical studies. So what is the longest duration study of post-ablation patients telling us you know, so is it 10 years? Because I know that the first ablation was in 1999, Hasegger et al. Yeah. So it's only been a procedure that's been around for 25 years. And yep. I guess in mainstream medicine, probably only been around for 20 years or something like that. So what is the longest duration of follow-up in terms of clinical studies that will say, okay, at 10 years, 60% were asymptomatic, not having any major AF, or is it five years? What um... most studies they stop at three years. Okay. Because remember to get a follow up for three years, you may have to do the study for ten years. Yeah. You first, you have to recruit the patient and yeah. op operate on them, and then you start uh, collecting their data afterwards. So usually it's about three years, four years uh, as data. But there are multiple centers who are who have done these procedures many many years ago. They are bringing up their data uh, for long term. Uh, mostly proximal atrial fibrillation do very well because uh, once we have isolated their veins, mm -hmm. then they fall into the group where they have non-pulmy vein, uh, pulmy vein related fo focus. Yeah. So they may come back with those foci. It, we haven't talked about atrial flutter as well because sometimes mm. atrial flutter, we find atrial flutter, we ablate it, declare success and the patient comes back with atrial fibrillation. Yeah. They started with these ectopic beats which start the flutter and we just get rid of the flutter and think that we are done. But then they come back a few years later in atrial fibrillation. So atrial flutter, atrial tachycardias is another very interesting which is a focus which fires and they can be inside the heart. So it's a, it's a sort of a story which keeps going on. They have shown some vulnerability mm -hmm. of developing atrial fibrillation from not only from the pulmonary veins but also from other tissues of the heart and remember when we are doing something inside the heart we are also doing something not what nature actually wanted us to do so that's a very interesting thing um, but one thing just because you touched on this i once upon a time did some uh, a video on af in the young and increasingly we're beginning to see lots of young people with af and my understanding is that some of them actually have a traditional uh, AV uh, uh, supraventricular, supraventricular tachycardia, tachycardia, which then the atria can't cope with and degenerates yeah. into AF and quite a significant proportion. So young people, sometimes you go in for an AF ablation and you find a pathway, an accessory pathway. Yeah. And if you zap the accessory pathway, which is just like breaking a road, it's mm -hmm. not like building a fence around mm -hmm. a way that sorts their AF out. That, it was our, uh, in, when we started doing the SVT ablation, the fast regular mm -hmm. rhythm problem where we, our electrophysiology actually boomed. Uh, we realized that especially patients with Wolf Parkinson White, they used to get uh, atrial fibrillation. And just correcting Wolf -Parkin Parkinson White pathway, which was a point burn uh, and a single burn, you can potentially cure their atrial fibrillation yeah. as well. So the reason probably was that uh, with the, uh, and usually it was multiple pathways. So we have to find different pathways. And these, during their tachycardias, were stimulating the atrium at different times creating a lot of uh, conditions where atrial fibrillation can develop. Once you get rid of those, then only those people who are truly proximal atrial fibrillation now presents. So this was very interesting. We used to find, mm. once we have uh, done the AF ablation and patient is back in normal rhythm, some people used to do a proper study to make sure that they are not missing anything. But these patients usually presented with fast and regular rhythm and then degenerated. Yeah. So you can talk to the patient and they will tell you exactly this is what happens. The history goes from one rhythm to another very clearly. It's very interesting. That's mm. very interesting. So one thing that you touched on and a lot of patients worry about is exactly what you said. It's not quite a natural thing to start burning within the heart, etc. And because the follow-up data is only three years, some guys are, you know, 25 years old. They have a potential 50 more years to live. 
what are the chances that if as we become more experienced and as more follow-up data accrues that we start seeing that there is something harmful resulting as a result of what we have been doing in their hearts what are the chances of uh, this resulting in let's say i don't know um, uh, an increase in dementia for example uh, or something like that yes there is a, there is a, a sort of talk about uh, dementia but let me go back to the uh, early days uh, early days uh, we were uh, ablating in the heart and then when we got a good control of this proximal atrial fibrillation we thought that we can manage the persistent impermanence as well so a lot of burning was done in the atria mm -hmm. and they used to create so many rhythm problems that uh, patient would come with flutters and these were flutters which we had never heard before roof related flutter floor related flutter interior flutter mitral flutter around the pulmonary vein flutters these were all iatrogenic we caused by we the created them. okay so generally we moved away from them we started lesser and lesser work inside the upper chamber of the heart or the atria so we started working only in the okay. veins now so generally now we just touch the veins. We don't do putting lines from the mitral to the mm. uh, to the uh, pulmonary veins or from roof lines because they were all causing more rhythm problems. Mm. So yes, there is a risk of more rhythm problems, and that we have tried to move away from by just doing the things very veins. very simple. Those patients who are who do need we will do them. Uh, there are very effective ways of managing uh, these flutters, but uh, rather not create them. Mm. That's what my first mm. is, don't do harm to the patient. So when you're burning around the uh, pulmonary veins, you can cause something called pulmonary vein stenosis, can't you? Which means that the blood that is coming from the lungs is gonna not come in as easily into the heart. That could potentially be a problem, could it? It, is, it used to be, because when we found that there is a tissue which is responsible for these firing, mm. automatically our thought was go and hit it, mm. as we were doing it in uh, pathways, that just hit this, mm. and if it stops working, brilliant. And that's what, where we realized that these veins are not forgiving. They just go into stenosis and block. And when the vein blocks, it causes sort of a a sort of a tumor like structure which you can see on a chest x-ray so very early on we realized that we are causing these pulmonary vein stenosis which can block so don't go inside the vein that's why this balloon becomes so important that as you inflate the balloon it just touches the circumference okay whereas when we were using point by point you may be inside not knowing mm. so that is why these mapping systems came and when mapping systems came they made sure that do, don't go and work inside the veins so pulmonary vein stenosis was one complication when we were doing a lot of burning inside the heart we sometimes created such a problem with the back of the heart that it formed a hole in it which then went into the esophagus our gullet oh so uh, fistula fistula between. formation and then patient would bleed into the esophagus oh, and they vomit blood very terrible almost fatal condition unfortunately very few patients survive that and then we are again we realize that we are doing this never heard of atrioesophageal fistula before af ablation now we were getting them reported repeatedly so then we moved away from this mm. so we have learned a lot from our mistakes now the simple things are uh, uh, sort of advocated we try to First, do no harm policy is now more mm. and more prevalent, and uh, we try not to generate more rhythm problems for the heart, for the patient. There's one question I had is that, okay, you do an AF ablation, there is something called a blanking period. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the blanking period? When we are doing an ablation, we are actually injuring the heart. So when we injure the heart, the heart reacts to it, so it can generate some rhythm problems. If you may have uh, you have done pacemakers you touch the heart it just jumps mm. so when you are burning it it is jumping mm. although it is upper chamber of the heart doesn't give you the uh, that uh, similar sensation as touching the lower chamber but we were burning we were doing a lot of damage to the heart and that burning would take some time to heal 
and during this healing process there were lots of rhythm problems but with burning and healing these rhythm processes started disappearing so we used to blank our results for three months after doing the ablation because this was a time during which this healing process was happening and the rhythm was coming back to normal so if i have done an ablation i would blank my results or even looking at the patient for three months and then call him or her back and ask how they are feeling and do my assessment so if you get an episode of af with say six weeks after your ablation that doesn't necessarily mean that the ablation has been unsuccessful you six, need to give. yeah six weeks we are touching the area where i would feel that um, i don't mm -hmm. think i have been successful okay. but say six days six days seven later. days okay. then if you get an attack i usually recommend come to hospital straight away we will shock your rhythm mm. back to normal because i want you to stay in normal rhythm for mm. the healing to uh, uh, to develop so the earlier you come to our attention the quicker you get back to your normal rhythm the better for this long term process so this is all amazing thank you so much one question i have is obviously uh, there are places uh, where um, you know, there's a lot of financial gain for medical professionals from things like AF ablation. And so uh, when you have that kind of incentive, doctors could potentially be pushing patients to have the AF ablation. Do you have any insight firstly? I mean, and you've ex basically explained to us that there has to be a very specific reason. If someone says, look, I can live with my symptoms then and their heart is OK, then there's absolutely no need to go for an ablation. So they don't need to spend thousands and thousands of pounds. But I was just wondering, do you have any insight into what the costs of an AF ablation are? Uh, costs are different uh, depending upon what uh, 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 catheters we are using. Uh, generally speaking, I, I usually don't recommend that uh, we should go for uh, private. It's uh, what if patients are very symptomatic, they can go both uh, uh, NHS or private. Uh, exact costs uh, in private sector, maybe three to four, five thousand, depending upon really? which, okay. which uh, okay. technologies you are using. I will, I will update you what yeah. the costs are. I think, I think it's interesting. I mean, I know certainly some people are paying thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of pounds and I speak to them and they say, you know, I need to this. And I, and of course, the other thing that struck, strikes me is that it's important to realize that often the AF is a symptom of something else. Mm. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, obesity, sleep apnea, excessive stress, alcoholism, that kind of thing. And to my mind, it's very important for patients to feel empowered that, look, you know, I can make these changes Absolutely. because if I make these changes, maybe my AF becomes less frequent. Yeah. But more importantly, the immediate chances of a success from my ablation are going to be greater if I've made all these changes upstream before yeah. before having the ablation. And the long term uh, likelihood of success is even greater because I've covered all these things. And more, more importantly, just because you have AF, you are not immune to developing a heart attack later on, you know, they, so you also want to always concentrate on becoming a healthier person wherever possible yeah. uh, to try and, uh, you know, optimize health. And then if you have symptoms, then it's important to, to adopt all these other strategies like an ablation. But it probably is not a just pick up and go for AF ablation. Because Absolutely that was not. Time. We would not offer it to patients who have a reversible cause. For example, mm -hmm. you can develop in thyroid problems, mm. overactive thyroid. Treat that, it is sorted. Mm. If someone is drinking a lot, I'm not going to be helping him much between an ablation mm. if he keeps drinking. So we have to reduce or moderate that. Mm. Uh, sleep apnea, you have touched very well. Uh, CPAP helps. Mm. That, uh, and especially weight loss. Mm. If you lose weight, you lose the. Uh, uh, you have to remember there's a focus and something has to irritate it yeah. for it to fire. So when a person is sleep apnea, their uh, uh, the intrathoracic the pressures inside the heart become such that it stretches the veins and they start firing more. Similarly, patients who are endurance athletes, they they go through very fast rates when they are really mm. cycling and very slow rates when they are sleeping mm. or when they are at rest. So these extremes of sort of uh, uh, heart rates, they create atmosphere or conditions where atrial fibrillation develops. So some 
quite a lot of former patients they come with uh, uh, who have atrial fibrillation they have been endurance athletes as well so they they have created some things inside their heart so there are lots of health uh, lifestyle changes which you have to consider quite a few of my colleagues they would not offer it on a wee people they know that it's going to fail complication rates are during the procedure are very high and uh, why take a risk when the benefit may not be that good especially when the reason for it is still there so there might be some other areas where which starts firing it it's very interesting you mention that because uh, there is a type of af called vagal af which is what these endurance mm-hmm. athletes get mm-hmm. uh, and obviously vagal af uh, is something that occurs during rest and digest it's a little bit more difficult to treat because beta blockers etc don't work as well they respond equally well to uh, ablation as well uh, atrial fibrillation uh, vagal atrial atrial fibrillation was our main interest when we were pacing the patients mm-hmm. because some of the patients they would benefit if you give them a pacemaker their atrial fibrillation disappeared yeah. and these were probably the vagal patients because they once you prevent the heart rate slowing, slowing down, down they don't fall into yeah. atrial fibrillation but multiple trials were done then done which, which included everyone not only exclusively the vagal patients and they showed that didn't work pacemakers don't prevent yeah. atrial fibrillation but i i think that now question whether the vagal patient would respond similarly mm-hmm. if uh, we can confirm that they are all again coming from pulmonary veins mm-hmm. they would respond very mm-hmm. similarly to the other patients who are coming uh, with atrial fibrillation so finally uh, let's say you have uh, carefully selected your patient your patient is symptomatic despite everything they are generally young they're healthy they're doing everything they can they're still paroxysmal they're very limited by their symptoms so an ideal patient what chance of success would you quote him uh, and what chance of side effect or complication would you quote him before he decides to go down that route very important for the patient to know this very important patient success rate is when we do it first time we quote 75 to 80 percent which is pretty good number mm-hmm. that uh, because one there is a possibility of reconnection mm-hmm. second his problem may not be there it may be outside mm-hmm. so we quote 80 percent as success in the first go if uh, the patient has a problem inside the vein and it has been isolated we are done if it is outside then they have to come back and the second procedure is quite different from the first one first we check whether the veins are isolated and then we look for other foci the what was the other question sorry i forgot uh, so the risk of complication the complications when good thing about uh, managing patients with tablets which control the rhythm and ablation is that whatever unfortunately has to happen happens on the day so it is something which uh, if you have gone through the first day yeah. without any complication you are ah, okay whereas rhythm medication amiodarone dronidarone mm. the ezetimibe uh, not ezetimibe um flaconide, flaconide. propofenone they have incremental risk with time the risk increases because you're getting older you so are getting older you are yeah, developing other problems yeah. and uh, you can come across patients who were tolerating flaconide very well now suddenly have a mi heart attack and their heart has gone weak now they cannot take uh, flaconide so the risk is on the day so the complication which can happen we have again learned a lot and we have tried to reduce those risks so nowadays we quote 1% risk of any serious complication bleeding around the heart we know immediately we drain it very very rare that we send patient for surgery extremely rare if you are careful with thinning the blood before the procedure and during the procedure the risk of stroke is minimized minimized mm-hmm. so we reduce the we thin the blood very generously with blood thinners beforehand and during the procedure and we keep an, an eye on that because the procedures are getting shorter and shorter the risk is getting smaller as well previously 4 5 6 hour long procedures we had to keep topping up with more and more warf- heparin and more Uh, blood thinning that has reduced with balloons there is one se- complication where we can paralyze one of the diaphragms because mm-hmm. the nerve which is passing to the diaphragm just passes 
over one of the veins. And if we freeze that vein and it hits that nerve, that diaphragm phrenic is nerve phrenic also. nerve valves. So we, we have ways of knowing how to prevent that from happening. Uh, esophageal fistula is very rare now. Mm -hmm. So is the pulmonary stenosis, extremely rare. You have to be really unlucky to have those, but uh, they are the things which made us understand it more and reduce the complications. Wonderful, great. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I yeah. don't think I don't think I have had such a generous and helpful discussion about AF ablation. You know, I talk about it, but it's so wonderful to talk to an expert like yourself. And um, the good news is that Dr. Nazir uh, is joining the York cardiology team. So if any of you have any questions that you want him to answer, uh, send them to me. I'll put them to him. And uh, he will also be accessible through um, the website, uh, cardiologist.com um, or yorkcardiology.co.uk. So once again, thank you so much for listening to us, Dr. Nazir. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege for me to listen to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be part of this. Uh, I like to educate, and uh, I, if uh, this opportunity is there, I would love to have it. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.